So we have a, a fantastic topic on the agenda, very actual. What is the research investment agenda? Because plant-based foods are really soaring in terms of market growth. There's so much activity going on and the products need to get better. Uh, there's also a need to get more sustainable. And it's also very important to be more independent from outside sources, uh, speci specifically in the European uh, context. So what do we have as a program uh, for you uh, this afternoon? Um, Siska Potti, uh, as uh, the Secretary General of the European Alliance for Plant-Based Foods in Brussels, will talk about the why, why is it important? And I will speak a little bit about the what, some work that we have been doing in the ecosystem. And then we've got an hour with five questions and in total uh, 10 uh, a person said to the table about their views, about when, what, what's the bigger context. The purpose of this webinar is always when we are doing things with Bridge to Food about informing to um, advance and actually to accelerate is also to know each, be, each other because together we can do much, things much faster. And so, um, Cisco, we've been working on the research investment agenda now together with lots of people involved, also with a, a stakeholder group um, from different um, uh, backgrounds. And now we are here and I think it's a very exciting moment, but I would like to give you the floor as you are so close to all the stakeholders uh, in uh, in Brussels and, and uh, with uh, organizations from all around uh, Europe. What is your why? Why do you think it is so important? Yeah, thank you, Herard and Charlotte. First of all, I would like to thank you to doing this, uh, this session together, because as you rightly said, we are really closely cooperating on this. And I think, as you said already, it's very important to join forces with as many stakeholders as possible, because I think the key to solution is really uh, collaboration. So, but um, to answer your question, of course, why is this important? I think the research is clear that we urgently need to transition towards more sustainable food systems, first of all, um, to reduce the global warming, but also to increase biodiversity. And last but not least, also to um, assure the food security for our uh, future generations. And this was again, recently confirmed again by the latest uh, EPCC report, and um, it is our opinion as European Alliance for Plant-Based Foods, of course, that um, transition to more plant-based foods and plant-based diets is a really impactful and also a pretty straightforward solution in the transition towards more um, uh, sustainable food systems. And um, it will also allow to reduce uh, the production of, um, of livestock and the consumption of uh, meat and dairy, because I think the research is, um, is uh, very clear on this as well. Over 60% of the greenhouse gases emissions in agriculture are attributed to livestock farming. And livestock farming is also, uh, it also represents 78% uh, of agriculture's uh, negative impact on uh, biodiversity. So I think one of the possible solutions to transition is to use more land to grow uh, a large diversity of uh, food crops, which uh, are, of course, the key ingredients for plant-based foods and then also for plant-based diets. And I think when we look at the market uh, data, uh, and also consumer research, these data, they show a clear interest uh, from consumers uh, for the plant-based foods alternatives and um, innovations. So the motivation from consumers, they, uh, they differ. Some have um, um, a concern about the environment, others are more concerned about um, animal welfare, or yet others are switching to more, uh, towards more plant-based foods options due to um, health concern. And the market data, which uh, we also gathered from the European um, Smart Protein Research, clearly shows an impressive growth of the sector. So the sales value uh, increased 49% uh, over the last two years, which is, of course, huge when you compare this to the average uh, growth in the, um, in the food sector. And the growth is uh, mainly driven by uh, the milk and, um, and the meat alternatives. When we look to another report, which the colleagues of uh, GFI have released uh, last year, we also see that, that there is a huge uh, level of investment uh, in the plant-based food sector. So in Europe alone, 
um, the amount of investments tripled compared to, uh, to last year, which also shows a clear economic interest and an economic case for the plant-based uh, food sectors. So, and whilst, um, but of course, there's a, there's a but, of course, these growth rates are very, um, very important and very impressive, but um, the absolute total plant-based food market share is still uh, very limited. It is estimated today to be around 6 8% for the uh, total dairy market and 1% or 2% only uh, from the total uh, meat market. So there's still a lot of opportunity uh, to grow. And in order to sustain and to, um, to accelerate uh, the growth of the plant-based food sector um, and the transition towards more plant-based diets, uh, we need um, to be able to offer a, a larger and a more diversified offer of tasty healthy and affordable plant-based foods. I think that is the key uh, challenge that we have because there is consumer interest um, and there is, of course, also the urgency. But, of course, we need to, to succeed uh, very fast in, uh, in bringing uh, a large offer of uh, tasty uh, and uh, diversified um, foods. So, uh, But in order to achieve this, much more dedicated research and innovation is needed. And that, of course, is the topic of today. And together with our partners, um, uh, Bridge to Food and uh, 60 other co-signatories, we are calling uh, also today um, towards the European Commission uh, for more dedicated funding uh, for the plant-based food sector. And of course, the panelists in the programme today will explain in much more detail um, in their field of expertise, what specific research is uh, is needed. So um, I will not take much more time for the introduction. Mm -hmm. This is just to set the scene, Herard, but I think yeah. people are eager to hear the experts uh, discussing on the needs. Yeah, well, I think you're an expert as well. And uh, many thanks for uh, a great uh, introduction. It's very clear that the why and the why is always driving uh, the watch, I think, in many ways. Eh? Purpose-driven agendas have more impact than just content-driven agendas. And uh, here are all the partners in the uh, European Alliance for Plant-Based Foods. So um, it's a great group. And uh, if you're interested later on, maybe ask also Siska if you can be involved in this. And, uh, transition to the what, following the why. Um, very shortly, uh, Bridge to Food is actively involved in a so-called global plant-based foods uh, and protein ecosystem, foods and proteins global, with 110 partners with 300 people meeting twice per month in different time zones for the last three years, working together actively on standardization, harmonization, research projects, very many different uh, topics that are there and you can see all of them are from different parts of the value chain so i think that's very important uh, to know it's not just food brands it's all the way down to the crops including canada with uh, mr pankaj joining this meeting as well today so uh, we have been working on on the what and um, we've broken up the content of the actually agenda in four different blocks um diet and health technology, foods and crops, and um, of course it's diet and health and then foods and then crops and uh, technology is an enabler, but there's many different parts and every time you can turn around the cube and find new combinations where are there new technologies used uh, for uh, chickpea, uh, like Innovo Pro is doing a fantastic job but not using any chemicals, or it's in the food uh, domain with new food applications or with new uh, type of uh, technology. So. First, um, talk about the crops. Well, it's very important that breeding needs to happen for crops, um, for new crops. And uh, lentil, chickpea, lupin and faba are, you could call, minor crops in Europe. And the whole value chain needs to be developed with different inputs. But it's also really breeding for food rather than for feed and with higher yields. If you look at this whole domain and the importance of it to really strengthen and position and, and build a kind of independent, fully integrated value chain, then you're talking about a 250 million budget on research minimum for a period of four years. 
So really when the Commission has high demands and transitions for the Green Deal, but also in uh, in other terms and diets and maybe um, uh, innovation, this is a very important pillar under the um, value chain of Europe. And some parts of that pillar are still very weak and uh, that is um, hindering innovation and it's hindering value for farmers and hindering opportunities for for growth and also making foods better so that consumers are taking more products to them. Um, the second one is in the uh, foods and technology. We've combined this because there is a lot of overlap. Sometimes the technology is used in foods, a liquid type of technology, and that's also used in ingredients. But definitely on the sustainability axis, uh, there are opportunities to really develop new types of food factories, possible integrations of food factories with ingredient factories, uh, which is very common in the dairy industry. So why not in the plant-based foods uh, industry? New milling, extraction, separation technology. I could continue, uh, but standardization and harmonization is a very, very important uh, factor for alignment between everybody in the value chain. And at the moment, a lot of food brands in Europe are very concerned to get the right quality of um, plant-based um, uh, um, uh, crops like pea or soy enough and the right quality for their um, high standard food production and those are those standards are higher than uh, maybe in the feed industry are being used in terms of pesticides etc etc so this is really uh, i think the uh, the middle part and one of the most important parts for scaling and accelerating plant-based foods uptake for diets and uh, a 500 million uh, budget is um, is very bare. It's the bare minimum of what needs to be done to do things in a very quick and, uh, and clever way, all the way from uh, research at different TRL levels, but also, and that's the last line, building showcase sustainable plants. Uh, there is a new plan being built for microprotein and in the plant-based uh, plant protein industry, these options are there as well. The last pillar is the, the diets one. Uh, let's not forget about the consumer. The consumer is very important. And uh, if we want to go uh, plant-based only, for instance, for elderly people, it's very important to understand actually the health impact uh, if that will take place. Studies haven't been done. Things are um, related also to nutritional performance. What's the impact on muscle health? What's the bioavailability? for crops as well as for ingredients, what's the effect of processing of um, plant-based foods ingredients, ingredients themselves, but also in uh, making a food. So you'll be looking also for this type of work uh, at um, a um, 250 million plus range of um, amount of budget. So in total, uh, if we will break it up and when we are preparing these uh, things further down the line, we will make it into smaller chunks, but it's very important that there's a big budget. To put it into perspective, around 200 million has been spent in the horizon in the last years. Paola from the European Commission will talk a little bit about that at the end of the webinar, uh, when, when she's part of the panel discussion. So um, scaling is accelerating and it is not doubling, it is five times more. And all the industries and all the players, including the research world, is very eager to be part of that. And uh, yeah, then the question is, of course, how that can be further adopted uh, and be implemented. So that's the what uh, in my uh, presentation. I would like to move now to the panel discussion um, with all those uh, great people here on the slide. And then I will go back to the um, actually uh, chat. Uh, to introduce everybody and start with the first question for the first question is actually always what is the bigger picture and the first question we have you know how do you see the role uh, in, of plant-based foods in the transition towards more sustainable uh, food systems and we have two experts here uh, Catherine you will introduce yourself with the Roquette in Green Company and uh, Sonia Kalkova on the food side of it. Catherine Le Formilo. I'm Senior Research Manager, Nutrition and Health at Rocket. I've been working at Rocket for now more than 16 years. Uh, two words about Rocket. Among other things, Rocket is a global leader in plant-based ingredients and pioneer of plant proteins. 
so we use plant-based resources to manufacture LC ingredients for various market segments and uh, various technical or nutritional functionalities. And we already have a range of protein ingredients called Neutralis. Uh, and my role at Roquette is an exploratory one. I'm more specifically focused on prospective research around new plant-based proteins and uh, derivatives and interested in their potential impact on nutrition, health and physiology, for example, obesity, blood glucose response. So I'm very interesting and, and pleased to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Catherine. Sonia? Yeah, so Sonia Kalkover, uh, R&D Director in Upfield and, and therefore Head of Product Development. So basically uh, heading up all the, the consumer finished products to market. Um, for the ones who don't recognize the name Upfield, um, we are the plant-based spread uh, company that has been split up from Unilever um, almost four years ago from now. But next to plant-based spreads, we uh, make uh, plant-based creams. Um, and plant-based cheese because the Via Life brand has also been added uh, to Upfield uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and our main mission is to, to basically make our full portfolio plant-based and, and therefore really delight the consumer um, because our belief is that, that there should be no hurdle for any consumer to step away from uh, animal-based uh, uh, food uh, to plant-based food and therefore make it taste uh, great uh, with the right functionality. So uh, beyond the fact that the production of plant proteins uh, specific, specifically from leguminous plants has a lower impact on environment through lower needs uh, in water, nitrogen, etc. Plant-based diets uh, already offer a lot of nutritional and health benefits. I'm working on it through their intrinsic uh, composition. So. Uh, for example, even if plant-based proteins have often um, a deficient profile in one essential amino acid, uh, eating a diet with a mix of plant-based sources allows the complementarity of amino acids and also of fibers. And uh, according to a recent review of uh, Professor Mariotti in France, it seems that classic vegetarian diets supply more than adequate protein and amino acids. Uh, secondly, I'm thinking of the recommendation of the World Cancer Research Fund, which recommends, among other things, to eat whole grains, veg foods, beans, consume foods uh, containing dietary fiber to, to reduce the risk of cancer, and specifically colon cancer. It is also in line with the WHO that recommends a level of energy intake that uh, should be uh, simply covering um, energy expenses to, pre to, prevent, uh, to prevent weight gain, uh, uh, obesity being uh, a huge uh, growing health concern at the planet scale. Finally, uh, increasing the number of plant-based sources in our diet has already been proven to induce health benefits uh, through uh, numerous epid epidemiological and scientific studies on Mediterranean diet. Uh, benefits for cardiovascular health, for health and wellness, and it has also been proven to be the dietary pattern with the most uh, consistent evidence for efficacy against uh, hypertriglyceridemia, which is related to cardiovascular disease. So I don't have time to detail further. This is just example. It's not exhaustive, but globally, the plant-based diet is beneficial for public health. And, uh, and can contribute to prevent communicable diseases and can increase longevity and reduce the health concerns and so also the costs related to health for governments. That, that's one uh, way of seeing the, the transition. I can see many different points that you've mentioned and uh, I think the long, long, longevity huh, is yeah. something that we should all uh, maybe like aspire to right and wish other people so i think that's a very nice uh, way of um, putting it into context sonia could i ask you what is your perspective yeah yeah from an upfield and, and, and personal perspective um like I, I fully agree with what catherine is saying from a nutritional point of view i think also we as a company were very much looking from um 
a sustainability angle. And if you look at, and, and I don't think we have to explain it to anybody here, but it's very obvious if you look at the carbon footprint, for instance, of plant-based foods versus uh, versus dairy food. So, for instance, if I take what we call internally our plant butter, um, if I look at the carbon footprint of that versus a real butter, yeah, there's a, a huge difference, of course. So for me, it's it's totally obvious that we need to make this transition for our earth and for our health. Um, and then working in, at the back end of the chain sort of to um, to make uh, fast moving consumer good products. Um, for me, what is critical in there is that we make them as tasty and functional as the consumer wants them to be, um, which can be a copy of, of the, the, the dairy or meat replacement. Uh, but it can all be, also be something else, because at least our belief is there, there are the vegans out there. There are the people who really want to make that transition. Great. Um, but that's not going to convince the, the majority of the consumer. So we want to make the life of the consumer super simple and therefore indeed price is going to be important um, to not have them hesitate why they would change over. Because if I can convince them in blind that the product is as nice and as uh, useful in, in their kitchen application or the likes, why would they not choose for it? So, so that's really our angle to make sure that we uh, really uh, meet the consumer need. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are reasons for limiting the switch to plant-based diet to, to overcome. I mm -hmm. think people have beliefs and fears, for example, they are afraid um, of a risk of flour protein intake or of flour quality uh, or essential nutrient deficiency risks. Mm -hmm. So, um, according to Professor Mayotte's review I just mentioned, in a fraction of vegans, there might be a modest risk of insufficient intake and further data are needed to assess the actual dietary pattern of people who report dietary intake corresponding to a low intake of protein and energy, uh, specifically more people uh, eating not sufficiently legumes, nuts, mm -hmm. seeds, and so on. So, um, so it would be an important part of uh, the research needs uh, in the context of nutrition and health. Mm -hmm. And additional scientific evidence-based communications uh, confirming the protein adequacy of vegetarian and vegan diet is warranted mm -hmm. uh, with an increased accessibility to, in to the information so that uh, nutritional recommendation can be applied and understood by most of the people. It does exist um, uh, different formats of uh, co communications in uh, countries. For example, in France, we have uh, some fruits and legumes par jour. It means uh, five fruits and, uh, and vegetables a day. But mm -hmm. it's easy to understand, but not enough defined in terms of nutrition. We have the Eat Well Guide in UK and so on. So what is common to all these models is to eat a lot of fruit, vegetable, complex carbohydrates, to choose lo uh, food low in saturated fat, salt, and sugar, mm -hmm. and so on. So, in this context, okay. meat and dairy represent small segments. Uh, oppositely, plant-based foods far more. So, there is a need to improve understanding and communication for everybody. Okay, okay, fantastic. And I think you're already making a bridge to the next uh, question for the the other group, and you're part of that. But I would yes. like to. Uh, that's great. And Sonia also mentioned something that is already on top of your mind: uh, price parity, but also taste, which is really important. Could I could I step out, zoom out, and ask you if we are now at six to seven percent? Huh? Um, uh, plant-based versus animal-based dairy type of products. From your perspective, if we are in 2030, we close our eyes. Where, where are we then? Because the research also has to contribute to something, right? Um, and and that, that's a belief of maybe a sector that will enjoy further growth or accelerating growth. Or what do you think will be um, there in terms of percentages in 2030? Question to Sonia. Apologies, I thought the question was to Catherine. No. Um, no. So, so what will be there? Yeah. To be honest, I'm I'm not li really looking into percentages. What uh, mm -hmm. in, in that sense? Huh? I'm more thinking about okay, and and that relates to the the other points as well in terms of research agenda. I think by focusing on um, what the consumer needs in the end to make the switch, and then driving that back in. Um, 
uh, how to overcome certain perceptions. Uh, so from a liking point of view, but very much also looking at what functionality do we need to build in applications. Um, and, and that can also be nutritional angles to it. Um, for me, those will be the relevant items and that should drive okay. the whole agenda forward, okay. I think. Okay, well, I think, thank you so much. I think this is also already a bridge to maybe the second uh, question for the panel, because now it's really about uh, what are the specific research needs, right? Uh, for different things. And I would like to ask maybe Mich Michelle, and thank you for answering the first question, uh, Sonia and Catherine, ask Michelle to come forward, as well as um, Matthias and uh, Catherine can stay here. Um, Michelle, could you introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Michel Mellema and I am leading the science and technology for a brand called The Vegetarian Butcher which Unilever acquired a couple of years ago and is now transforming the, itself into a major brand in Unilever. Uh, so that is the area I'm currently working mm -hmm. at. Okay, thank you. And uh, Matthias? Yes, hello everybody. My name is Matthias. I'm the president of Dona Soja. Dona Soja is a European membership-based organization uh, linking farmers, uh, breeders, processors, food companies, retailers. Uh, in the protein transition towards sustainable European protein. And I have uh, also have background in the, in the dairy-free uh, industry. I was the founder of Mona Group, number two uh, European non-dairy producer. So I have a long background working with plants and yeah. uh, raw materials. Thank so, you. So, Ro thank you. Roquette is in, uh, like, call it protein transformation or crop transformation into ingredients. Um, uh, um, uh, Vegetarian butchers in making foods, and you are in the value chain with a lot of connections also to to the crop. Maybe if I could ask, uh, start with you, from farm to fork, uh, Matthias. What do you think uh, are for you the most important areas for specific research uh, to accelerate the uh, the transition? Yeah, maybe I can give you a little bit of a European perspective. I think when you <laughs> look at what kind of consumers are we talking to, we are uh, people who want to have a flexitarian diet, um, vegan diets, vegetarian diets, very often are affluent, uh, well-educated people. And apart from uh, wanting to eat less or no animal food anymore, they are also very interested in other uh, topics like regional uh, food, low processing, um, less ingredients. And I think that's an area where there's a lot of research needed to really conquer the European market. Because many products that we are um, having in the supermarkets now are really very globalized products with a lot, a lot, very long value chain, many ingredients, and I think this is a very important part to con to convince consumers that uh, the food is um, also conforming to other values they have. Um, I also think it's very important that we um, create a perspective for European farmers, because at the moment a lot of the farm uh, farm organizations are really are, are op um, opposing. Uh, what the industry is doing, because they don't see value added in the farm. Um, they say, okay, our industry, the new plant-based industry, is taking value from the farm into the factory. So instead of eating meat or milk produced in farms, we are eating milk um, and dairy-free products or meat-free products made in factories. And they don't see a value in that. I think that's a mistake, because I think there's lots of value for farmers uh, there. But I think we need to, a strategy to link what we do uh, so what the consumers want, regional, local, low processed food with value chains to the farm. And we need investment in specific uh, in, in specific topics like um, special crops, um, new crops, uh, value systems that involve farmers. I think that will be very, very important for uh, also reaching consumers because European consumers are very attached to their farms and their farmers. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very interesting communication, but also uh, get adoptance. Huh? Uh, and, and food technology. Um, Michelle, could I move to you from the consumer side? What's your view? Sure. Well, it's been said before, huh? um, in line with the earlier mentioned obvious needs for the planet, we need to move to plant-based diets. Huh? And uh, Unilever's aim is for plant-based nutritional diets to become maximally available for everyone. And I think there are three pillars that are really important there. Um, first and foremost about cost, and secondly about taste, and thirdly about nutrition. Uh, to start with the sensory bit, as Sonia already said, first and foremost, re research in this field needs to focus on taste and sensory. 
Uh, it seems like an obvious thing to do, but I don't think sensory is always seen as a serious academic topic on its own right yet. Um, changing behavior away from ingrained patterns is very, very difficult and for, uh, for instance, new meat or new dairy taste is key to crack. And it's not only about governmental campaigns, because I think they have limited effectivity when they tend, they tend to point in different directions anyway. Uh, but the most powerful is to show actual improvement in sensory. Uh, so sensory is a high tech area. I think that's key to, to unlock with lots of room for improvement. Maybe similar in complexity in many respects as making a good electrical car, I would say. So mm -hmm. I'd like to ad advocate my favorite slogans. Sensory is a serious science. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when it comes to the two other pillars, cost and nutrition, I think uh, there's an underlying agronomy question that's still not probably addressed. So if you are a Euro European livestock farmer, you want to shift away from livestock. Mm, Michel? Yeah. Yeah, you're back, but it, it flipped a little bit. Maybe okay. Plug that, now it's better. So the, the last thing I said is, is if you're a European livestock farmer, you want to shift away from livestock and you want to grow plant protein, what do you go for? Uh, so what crops do you grow? How do you get into your diet in the most efficient and least processed manner? So in short, we need science to help uh, livestock farmers to make the transition to plant-based. Uh, it's a complicated multidisciplinary field that needs multiple partners working together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Catherine, you mentioned already something about nutrition, right? Science and yeah. nutrition. When you listen yeah. to Michel and to Matthias, is there something else that pops in, pops on your mind? Yes, a lot. Um, so I think, yes, there is a need to focus on a large uh, plant protein nutritional quality characterization because we have a lot about, for example, uh, dairy proteins, uh, but uh, not enough uh, for plant-based proteins. So amino acid profile, digestibility, etc. Uh, this information um, is less extended, less published as compared as animal sources. And um, also there is a need to um, for harmonization of the methodologies, because, for example, we should develop in vitro methodologies to do these analyses. And, uh, and we need to have a standardization uh, to do it on similar sources or on different sources or on similar for example, uh, isolates of protein or uh, concentrates of protein, and to have uh, a classification uh, accessible and um, made, uh, made public. We could also, through this type of analysis, uh, explore more the complementarity of proteins, of fibers. Uh, we should also identify more for the taste and for the nutritional quality, the anti-nutritional factors, and more generally, better understand um, the, 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 the different uh, constituents of plants uh, that we have to, to process also to, to manufacture ingredients. So there, there are gaps to be filled to also better understand physiology, synergies. And, um, and uh, yes, you mentioned the work on the taste. Uh, there is no nutrition without a good taste. And this is a, a type of new gastronomy to be developed to, mm -hmm. to overcome limitations. And finally, I would mention that uh, there is uh, also um, a study to be done on the real impact on the nutritional quality of the processes, but also in a positive way, because as uh, it was also uh, said, uh, if we want uh, diverse, diversify and uh, offer uh, a more rich uh, possibilities to, to consumers, uh, we have also to, to, to show that we could use a lot of different ingredients uh, that could be uh, good for nutrition, good for health and good for taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I, if I would kind of summarize and I'd like to pick your brains if it's a good summary or not. What I, what I, the question was, what are the specific research needs? What I, th those needs are um, in a certain way, I think, well-defined. But what Michelle was doing, and, and I think you in a certain way as well, Catherine, saying, well, it's also a new research science fields that need to be integrated into this approach and to be connected to it. And um, that's an integrated kind of research strategy on the needs and on the science fields, right? And what I heard 
from uh, Matthias. He said, well, you know, traditionally, uh, maybe there's a research uh, domain, but you need to link it to the business uh, and connect really the, the farmers with the green companies, with the food, and, and, and make a business uh, case as well to grow all those crops, because if you don't do that, then harmonization doesn't make sense. Uh, monetization doesn't make sense. Do, do, do you agree, uh, Matthias, with that? Oh, yes, sorry. I think that, that's correct. And there's also, um, you know, one the problem is the plants that we are using for food are mostly um, um, kind of arbitrary. They're not made for the topics that we need, for the, for the products, mm -hmm. that, for the applications that we need. You know, all the plants that we consume have been made by humans for specific topics. When you look at the plants that we have today, many have been bred, bred for, for feed purposes. So mm -hmm. there's a big um, big possibility to cut out processing, shorten production lines and uh, reduce uh, processing um, needs when you have the right plants. And this needs a new approach because we are all used to work with commodities. So mm -hmm. Big national companies, they are buying commodities. And, and when we are talking about specific plants, that's, that's a different approach needed to integrate value chains with farmers. And that's a big mm -hmm. challenge for everybody. And I think a big topic for discussion and also for research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you also add the, the new word to it, right? A new re, re look at things to really advance and to scale. Yeah, it's it's integrating integrating breeding and processing is a very promising field of activity and research yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, I think Roquette knows a lot about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a lot of people as well. Okay. Super. Yeah. So I think in view of time, I would like to move to the next uh, question then, of course. If, if it's all clear what we should be doing, then what is hindering us to get there? And that's the, the, the second question. And I have, again, two very wise people here, Anne-Louise from Denmark and uh, Michelle again. But could I first ask you, Anne-Louise, to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, my name is Anne-Louise and I'm the Director of Food Technology at Danish Technological Institute, which is a, a Danish research organization. So I'm kind of representing the research organizations here um, in this forum. And we work with a lot of Danish and European companies on developing new types of food. Of course, a lot of plant-based right now. Mm -hmm. And well, Michel has introduced himself from the food brand and, and the research institute and you work I think uh, as Unilever with many research institutes around the world, not just in Europe, right? So I think you could have a very good perspective about yeah, what is hindering maybe further development in um, advancing with these research needs uh, from a European perspective. And not 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 saying that you, you shouldn't be looking outside uh, Europe, but uh, what do you think is for, for you the main hurdle? Well, I think yeah, one step back is I think focus will help. So um, I know attention is currently spread over a lot of different crops. Eh? So many different parties talk about many different potential crops for protein. Mm -hmm. While it might maybe wise to choose a spearhead crop, I would say. Uh, so could we grow European soya, pea, faba, or fungi in Europe, cost effectively, minimally processed to make nice tasting product that consumers actually buy? That would be the holy grail of protein transition, and, but it needs to come with a choice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one, one, one other unique benefit of plant protein, if you've cracked one, uh, you've chosen for one, is a unique benefit compared to meat or dairy, is that in principle you could obtain longer shelf life which would make these options even more sustainable than they already are because it reduces packaging, food waste, etc. So I'd like to emphasize this uh, and I'm really looking forward to technologies that enhance this, this feature specifically. So those are the two things that come to mind uh, uh, at first, uh, Gerard. Okay. And uh, Anne-Louise, what is your position? Yeah, I would say, of course, yeah, like you say, Michelle, the, the focus, I would also say the funding, of course, for doing more research. I mean, I'm uh, I'm situated in Denmark. We spent the last, I think, 200 years researching in how to uh, how to um, grow or how to breed pigs and how to uh, to produce dairy. Right. So we need to really catch up in this field. So we need a lot of research 
in how to make these. Um, first of all, as you say, Matthias, what are the crops? We don't have to take the commodities. We have to develop brand new um, cultivars of the crops that are that are aiming at the food that they are going to be instead of just being mm -hmm. aimed at, at being uh, feed. And then we also have to develop the, the right products that the consumers will uh, will take up. So I think there's a lot of, of research needed and for that we need yeah focus and funding, I would say. Mm. And, and focus, you could also say vision, right? Mm. Vision and yeah. funding, vision and budget. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so what is then uh, lacking the development of a vision? Because that, I think that comes first before you can ask for a budget. I would expect. Or doesn't well, it work like that? Yeah, it might be wise to, to spend a bit of research on holistic studies, eh? so meta-analysis of different crops, and uh, that should allow you to, to see whether certain crops are more efficient than others or uh, have a high chance to succeed. And then you have different criteria like nutrition or growth speed or, or whatever. Uh, and in principle, that, that's a science by itself, and it, that those are very interesting studies to start. And then you can all agree there's a top three or top four that is most suitable for, for middle Europe, uh, for instance. And then you could focus all your attention on getting new breeds or improved breeds of those, uh, which can make, really make a difference. If you spread the attention to lots of different crops and everybody is trying to find his own niche of, of a certain crop, then you'll be fighting against each other. And 90% and, and of those crops will not hit the market ultimately because they are in a worse position than the 10% that are at the top at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So focus is to me is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a, a kind of uh, economic value uh, vision huh? in, in a certain way uh, yep. for the European agricultural industry. And uh, there is a vision now in Denmark, right, Andres? The, uh, there is a budget also, right? The, the government changed. What was the reason for um, the vision or what's the vision itself? Um, I think it's connected to the to the overall goal of Denmark being uh, uh, CO2 uh, neutral by 2050, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And the government in Denmark realized that we need to put some specific funding for the plant-based area to really drive this forward. Uh, so now they're just consolidating who is uh, who is managing this these funds and everything. But there's a lot of of, of research money now put forward for this uh, to really accelerate this, and I think also at a European level we should we should try to do the same and focus on the plant based research, and not just uh, adapting the. I, I hope there's not a lot of Americans here, but not just adapting something from overseas, but also <laughs> having Europe as a driver in this in this uh, in this new field. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it's great that there is a vision. Huh? which is translating into budgets. If you look at, again, the historic perspective of the dairy and the meat industry, is it a significant investment or is it a real nice start uh, to get things going? Um, uh, what we've seen in Denmark now, it's a start. It's not, there's still a lot of uh, research money, of course, going into the traditional areas. And that's because it's also a, a big part of the income of uh, of Denmark as as such, so that's of course mm -hmm. this is we can't change it overnight, but we need to put some focus on it. And I, I think what you say, Michelle, about choosing some specific crops, if we could do it in a clever way and trying to breed mm -hmm. our way into how will they function very good for foods, would be a, a good way forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things things take energy and time, eh? and meat and dairy have, have been around for a long time, and if. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you talk about the Wageningen ecosystem where I'm in, there's lots of knowledge around desiccating all sorts of ingredients in, in dairy protein, for instance, huge amount of knowledge. Before you arrive at that point with the plant protein, you have to spend a lot of energy. And I, I only think soya is close to that, and that's why soya is applied in so many so many areas, because it's just a lot of knowledge. And if you now sp spread the investment over gaining knowledge over 30 new crops, basically you'll get nowhere in, in, in a period of five years time because you're competing with such a vast amount of knowledge in the other areas like um, like uh, soya and uh, and dairy. Mm -hmm. And I see Matthias nodding and he's uh, on a day to day basis working in this field. Could I ask you to come forward, Matthias, and share your um, 
Yes, I would. I think, I think what Michelle said is very um, important. I think um, it's clear that there is a research gap for for many of these what, what we call niche crops. Right? We have been focusing also in Europe when you look at breeding uh, and see uh, Thesai is here from Euroseeds. Most of the investment in breeding have gone into very few crops like wheat, corn, and some other some of the other crops. Um, and there was very little investment in other, for example, leguminous crops or other possible uh, protein crops. And as Michelle said, and I think it's very correct, you cannot, if you spread it basically over all crops, you will get nowhere. So it, it is a strategic need to define a, a couple of crops that we want to invest in in Europe and, and try to upscale them. And there's a need for public investment in this part, especially in the beginning, to close the research gap in functionality for this uh, for these uh, smaller crops. Yeah, so we need to focus in some areas and and, mm -hmm. and focus has to be regional. It, it's also a little bit of a problem sometimes in European investment. There were always calls for for all of Europe, but they're totally different agronomic zones. If you think about Greece, for example, and Denmark, you have totally different um, agronomic conditions. So you have to have a regional approach and say, OK, we could grow, I don't know, this uh, two or three or four crops. And then there's a need for investment, strategic investment in these crops that link the processors and the breeders because they don't speak the same languages. You know, it's, we had this meeting that it's very interesting uh, when, when the breeders ask the, the, the food industry, what do you really need? You know, and, and they really don't understand each other yet. You know, there's a lot of work to be done in the middle, linking breeders and the food industry together. And, and making strategic choices. And I think that the European Commission also has to um, um, try to think in an in a agronomic zone or regional approach, because it doesn't make sense to call for new proteins for all of Europe, because that doesn't lead anywhere. We mm -hmm. need to focus on zones, let's say, I don't know, Poland uh, and Denmark and southern Sweden and so on could be clustered together, maybe. And then mm -hmm. other regions, uh, and then you need different, and, and then there will be different um, different uh, crops that we can produce there. And then we need to invest in in the in, in the in the in the crops, in the breeding, and in the research, because most breeders they just analyze uh, protein. They say, okay, I have so much protein. But what kind of protein do they have? What functionality does the protein have? What is about solubility? Mm -hmm. All of these questions. Mm -hmm. um, the breeding industry needs to also learn and uh, and interact with the food industry okay. more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that addition. It's very clear. It's vision and focus uh, to uh, the, the progress in this uh, field. Uh, thank you, Michel, and also Catherine in the last uh, panel, and uh, Matthias and Anne-Louis. I would like to move to the next question then. And that's, I think, also uh, very much related to what you've just said. What's the role position of Europe in, in the research itself? Is in the terms of uh, being an innovation hub compared to other regions around the world. Uh, could Europe um, develop itself as a plant-based food hub? And for that, um, we we have Matthias again, um, and also Sonia from Upfield. And the new uh, um, expert on the block, I would say, is uh, Cesar from Euroseeds. Uh, and you work with many uh, breeders. And so they also work, uh, I think, internationally, not just in Europe. But first, uh, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation, first of all. Um, my name is Cesar Gonzalez. I manage public affairs in, in Euroseeds, and I'm also responsible for our internal protein task force. Um, for those who don't know Euroseeds, Euroseeds is the European association that represents breeding and seed producing uh, companies and as Herard uh, rightly said indeed the companies the breeding companies themselves are extremely international even the smaller and the, the medium-sized companies so it needs is a very international sector yeah. so so maybe to start with you Cesar if it's okay uh, your breeders are growing and also developing seeds for animal feed uh, industries but also for the food industries and um, um, is there something related to yeah the role and position in of of science in this field in europe where your your stakeholders are saying well you know we don't have enough critical mass to to go uh, and scale or we see some hot spots and if we do this and this and this maybe uh, europe could also develop itself into a certain hub Maybe also in view of what Michel and Matthias were saying and Anne-Louise about the focus. You can't grow all the crops maybe at the same time. What, what would be your view here from your member's position? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would divide 
the reply into in two, two parts. Uh, the first one mm -hmm. would be the overall one <coughs> that uh, we have been advocating for a long while already on a European strategy because indeed scaling up it's it's much needed. I mean, sometimes member state base is not enough, even if it's a big member state. So mm -hmm. I agree. I think it was also Matthias who, who mentioned that. Um, yeah, um, we have to acknowledge that member states alone might not be uh, able to create this critical mass that would allow private investments because in this mm -hmm. what we are probably looking at is private investments that would steer the discussion then on the other side um, i would say if you go to specific crops and i think that was also anticipated by michelle in the previous question um, you have crops that are very well um, very much researched and that you have a very broad knowledge of them but um, there are many many others and especially when we think about proteins that would uh, qualify as niche crops and in those niche crops i mean it's it's not only breeding uh, i would say it's also other inputs etc the available tools are much fewer and that indeed it's a it's a barrier to to create solutions for those crops so you have the overall um, size of the of the market and then the specific one in, in both cases uh, reaching that uh, critical size also for in terms of research uh, basic mm -hmm. research to, to catch up it's it's mm -hmm. extremely needed but i would say overall it's more important the strategy than the specific uh, crop uh, yeah strategies integrated strategy again and yes, Ma yes. matthias can i make the bridge to you um because you're working with other uh, people also in your organization uh, with breeders and also retailers right the full mm -hmm. value chain so is is there a competitive position by a very integrated approach that europe itself could also benefit from um, maybe we can look a little bit at the experience that we had with european soya and michelle has said it soya is a, generally a plant that has been well researched but also in europe there was very little res research on, on on soy going on in the last let's say 40 years but this has changed uh, and the reason it has changed was a mixture of public investment and um the the understanding in the in the in the in the whole value chain that this crop is going to grow so there was a certain um hype that people said okay this is a crop we want to invest in and this is a, all parts of the value chain from the breeders all the way to the processes to the users and i think we have to create a similar success stories for other crops in europe um, european farmers are very well suited for the challenge because we have many very well educated and smaller farmers in europe that's different to uh, overseas countries to countries in the americas etc so farmers are very well suited to grow niche crops but there needs to be a strategy uh, in finding uh, and defining which crops we should focus on defining the agronomic areas that they are suited for and uh, developing the value chain and developing markets in hand in hand with uh, processing, breeding and all of that. And I think that in the first part, so developing a strategy is it, there's a lot of public, um, um, let's say public um, value and there's also a need for public investment. So we need a, a, a research strategy, we need a up, upscaling strategy and I think this is something we should uh, we should work on together. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody can do it alone, uh, but we can all do it together, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. then we should find, uh, as I said before, regions, climate regions uh, and suitable crops for these regions and, and start to work on developing the chain, uh, starting with the breeding all the way to the to the food processing. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe Sonia, to your point, because you're also working with many research institutes, right? Uh, the question is, could, could Europe uh, develop a, a more maybe distinctive or meaningful position um, um, by being seen as a food hub with uh, fantastic research. Is there enough critical mass? Do you believe in it that this could be something for Europe? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Gerard. I think it could. Um, my hesitation you might uh, might hear yeah. is, and, and that's the, the beauty or, or the difficulty we have in Europe. We have so many countries. So mm -hmm. uh, if I compare it, for instance, to Canada, they as a country has said, yes, we have an objective because we want to achieve this for our country and our farmers and whatever. So for me, I think the key thing we have to find, what is the common objective 
to do it. it. It probably links also to what you were saying, Matthias, in terms of um, have, what solutions are we trying to solve? Are we trying to have a, or do we have a commonality in terms of finding a way for the farmers to make the transition? Do we have a commonality in terms of what type of applications do we want to serve from a consumer point of view, from a functionality point of view, like Michel said? So I think you need to find a critical mass on which problems are we trying to solve together and then work from that, because otherwise it, it's a beautiful, it sounds beautiful, let's do it together. Mm -hmm. But if people don't have the same objective or multiple objectives, yeah, mm -hmm. then I, I wouldn't see it to work. Okay. Very simple moonshot 2030, I say. Yeah, why not? But I think we have to create that urgency and then yeah. say, what what do we really believe in that are these commonalities that we're going to go after? And then indeed make some choices on crops and, and stuff like that and go for it. The trouble only is how to bring that all together mm -hmm. and where to make those smart choices. Yeah. Well, but I'm not the expert on it either, but I no, in, that, in that way no. I could see it work. I, yeah. I, I, I for for the purpose of the next uh, topic, I made a comment on the moonshot 2030 because the European Commission, I think about four years ago, worked with an English professor, Italian uh, by nature, on moonshots. What do we need to really uh, make big steps? So, um, for uh, I would like to make the step now to the last question of the panel, where we have um, Cesar uh, again together with uh, Anne Louise and also Paola from the European Commission. Um, and uh, if I would uh, like to ask you, Paola, to introduce yourself and maybe then also I will ask you the first question about what the Commission has already been doing. But, but please introduce yourself first. Sure. Um, so thanks for, for, for the invitation, first of all. Um, I'm Paola Ulalio. I'm uh, working at the European Commission, uh, DG Agriculture, uh, in the unit of research and innovation. And uh, among my responsibilities, I have the, the plant crops or protein uh, crops portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And maybe my, my question to you is then, mm -hmm. yeah, when we discussed it before, it says if you I think Confucius said, if you don't know where you're coming from, it doesn't mean anything where you're going to go, right? And, and the question here is, um, you have already spent as a commission a lot of money in the past in this. Could you explain a little bit about what happened in the last maybe four to six years with mm -hmm. budgets and directions around plant-based proteins? Sure. So, um, uh, yeah, so listening to, to all of you and all this, um, uh, the what, the why, the how and the issues, uh, I think that from from the research and innovation side and investment, um, I believe uh, that a substantial effort has been done in the last years uh, to try to unlock uh, the, the potential of legume crops uh, to contribute to the agri-food and feed system. And um, I would say that starting up back in 2016, uh, the European Commission strategic approach to the EU agricultural research and innovation uh, identified um, integrated ecological approaches from farm to landscape levels as, as a big priority and based on this priority um, an investment of more than two 240 million euros has been done for the period 2014-2020 uh, and there um, many projects uh, more than 40 projects were were funded uh, dealing with various aspects huh, of agroecological approaches, not only legume crops, or, but uh, but among them there were many about uh, mixed farming and uh, research projects uh, benefiting legume uh, um, at different scales. Um, and so the, all this investment includes, uh, as you can imagine, the, all the Horizon 2020 projects, huh, the, the big mm -hmm. program Horizon 2020. Um, there are several projects uh, where, where uh, protein-based, um, uh, crop-based foods were, were um, developed. I, I have a list, but due to time constraints, I will not go through the whole list, but I can say that um, um, projects uh, investigating transition paths uh, to increase sustainable legume cultivation and, cons and, and consumption have been funded also um, uh, for, for um, yeah, the, the, to increase the knowledge and the best practices on sustainable legume crops. Um, then there were crop, uh, projects about breeding, uh, what I am hearing a lot here, um, breeding strategies for uh, major economic uh, important uh, um, crops. 
um, there was specifically one topic um, uh, on alternative proteins for food and feed, uh, which um, under Horizon 2020, which funded four projects uh, for a total of 32 million euros. So that was a big investment as well. And those projects dealt with uh, not only plant products, but also microalgae and um, uh, insects. Now, that was also an important uh, yeah. a, a protein uh, source that I have not heard much about that. Mm -hmm. um, and now there are ongoing still uh, ongoing projects funded under 20, uh, Horizon 2020, which are we have not finished. Mm -hmm. um, there are many on again on the use efficiency, so trying to reduce uh, uh, fertilizers used, um, those linking also with the uh, bio uh, circularity. Uh, projects on uh, to enhance management and use of, of genetic resources, of legging re genetic resources. So there's really a, a broad um, a variety of, of uh, research ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, and I could say that uh, then following uh, in 2018, you, you, you may all know about the report uh, the, of the Commission on, on the protein plan, uh, mm -hmm. so development of, of plant proteins in the EU. Uh, so, as from then, uh, more political impetus was given uh, to continue looking at the opportunities uh, of plant protein crops. Um, and also an emphasis was given on the economic and environmental potential of these uh, plants. Um, so, they need to boost competitiveness uh, from this uh, production in the EU, promoting its benefits and so on. And, and here's where Horizon Europe comes, uh, the, the new uh, uh, pro, a specific program of Horizon Europe with an exclusive uh, broad line on uh, supporting EU plant protein production for food and feed. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a specific area, intervention area for that. Uh, well, intervention is more for agriculture and forestry and rural areas, but within that there is a specific line on, on, on plant proteins. Um, and so for Horizon Europe, um, we have had one work program, so the work program 21-2022 were, um, I would say, from the DG agriculture side, three projects uh, have been funded or are going to be funded mm -hmm. uh, for a total of uh, 23 million euros. Um, these projects are on, uh, one is on, on boosting breeding, so uh, on the breeding part of legume sector, and the other one is more on um, stimulating the land-based crop production for food and feed. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are other 20 million euros going uh, under this work program to alternative proteins, as I said, uh, more on under um, uh, to look more for, for other sources. I'm talking about uh, insects, microalgae mm -hmm. uh, and etc. Um, so I think that, uh, well, then we have work program 23, 24, 24, but this is not yet um, published, so we have to wait until the end of the year for the for the adoption of this program. Mm -hmm. um, so just to add to the um, horizon, I want to just shortly mention about the IEP Agri. So we have also the other um, uh, source or option for funding um, of research is uh, um, um, through the operational groups that you may have heard and this brings back to to um, what you were um, uh, our colleagues were mentioning about um, having more uh, regional um, um, based uh, research so these mm -hmm. are groups um, with a, the, the view is providing answers to more local issues. So they are bottom up local innovation projects. Huh? Uh, these are funded separately, it's not like Horizon, they are under the um, rural development funds, but these groups cover various aspects also of uh, protein plants. Hmm? And um, this is uh, a very important um, point for member states. Um, and last but not least, I um, this links back to the CAP. Um, uh, so, as you know, the CAPS also gives uh, the, the common agricultural policy then give, gives mm -hmm. uh, uh, support now to member states to, to establish uh, programs uh, in the protein sector and um, they have the possibility to reward um, environmental benefits of legumes uh, through eco schemes or other um, initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. Yeah, so I, I think this is um, a summary. <laughs> 
a very elaborate list and uh, I think uh, it's great for all of us to understand the bigger picture from uh, what has happened and where things uh, are going. I wanted to ask you something. You mentioned that you are now preparing the next round for Horizon 23-24, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, everything that's happening in this panel and with all the different platforms, is there something that there is some interest in consulting with, you know, all the stakeholders uh, about the directions for the budgets for 23-24 from the Commission point of view? So, so uh, surely this, uh, all these um, conversations and uh, um, uh, and the needs that are that are brought here in these groups are, are extremely mm -hmm. important and very useful, of course. And uh, and the um, amounts of the budget that you were mentioning that you think that would be needed for making things right. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, yeah, so this is something that um, deserves a lot of uh, discussion, of course, and it's uh, out of my remit, but um, mm. in terms of research needs and gaps and um, um, what is really lacking, I think it's uh, extremely, mm -hmm. yes, extremely important. Okay, well, mm. thank you for, for being open to the discussions and the ideas that are coming forward, one way or the other. A very short in view of time, Cesar and Louise, I realize that um, uh, we're running a little bit in, uh, over time, but is there something, um, Anne-Louise, from your point of view, that you could say, well, you know, uh, uh, how should these f funding programs look like in TRL levels or in different ways? What is your view from your position? I think it's very important that we remember on the food side, at least, I don't know if it's the same on the, on the breeder side or the crops, but on the food side, uh, a lot of this is uh, driven not only in the big companies, but also in the smaller SMEs. And I think we need to remember that uh, we need some funding schemes that also allow the SMEs to come in with their innovative ideas uh, from all around Europe. And I think for that, we need maybe, um, I think it would be beneficial to have smaller projects that don't have as many partners that, yeah. as we often see a demand mm -hmm. for in the horizon Europe. Um, and also maybe some of the projects being shorter or faster because this this field is moving really fast. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of innovation going on uh, all around Europe and we don't need um, mm -hmm. to slow it down, right? We need to, to speed it up further. Sure. Um, so yeah. I think we would need shorter mm -hmm. uh, projects that would also allow the SMEs more room, okay. from my opinion. Fantastic. Good, good extra point of view. Mm -hmm. and then also probably to yeah to elaborate a bit on that for us i would say um there are these two elements public funding and private funding mm -hmm. um and in order to let's say unlock all the possibilities for private funding the competitiveness of the chain it's a key element from mm -hmm. um, the processors till uh, readers in our case but um and then coming back to the idea I was uh, presenting about the strategy, um, the European Union has a lot of uh, possibilities in terms of policies, indeed. But uh, from our point of view, it's not only that. I'm sure uh, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, Horizon Europe, probably promotion policy are very good elements to, to consider. But also um, the legal certainty uh, to allow, for instance, new innovations in our case, probably, I don't know, new learning techniques, uh, better use of digitalization, etc. So there are many other aspects that could be introduced in this strategy that would allow um, the sector to develop, unlocking the potential of private funding. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Also, again, the business part of it, eh? enabling business to uh, move forward um, and not see it as a separate field. An integrated approach I hear again. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask uh, Siska to come forward to maybe explain something which is related to an a point that's mentioned many times, which is the vision and, uh, and the direction, right? And I think, uh, Siska, you have prepared the uh, stuff, uh, a letter together with your members and also yeah. with the ecosystem. Could you explain a little bit about what's on your launch plan? 
Yeah, I think what we have prepared together with uh, many co-signatories active in the field is, of course, a call a call towards the European Commission um, and also to, to public and, and perhaps also later on private funding to have more dedicated research. I think uh, mm -hmm. during the panel discussion here, it's it's obviously it's clear that still a lot of research is needed and dedicated research specific for plant-based. I mm -hmm. think these were very good uh, insights if we could work together uh, to have this strategy to define those crops which are needed, uh, to have also a, a better understanding of the value chain, so which crops are needed for which foods and how can we make. I think this, there's there, there are gaps and I think we need to continue this discussion to clarify further uh, what is needed. And then I'm, I'm very happy to hear also from the Commission that uh, perhaps for the next calls of proposals. I think there will be still two calls of proposals in the Horizon Europe. There might be uh, some more specific attention to the points which we have uh, raised here. And I think the panel, the experts, I'm, I'm certain that they are very willing to um, to define further or to elaborate further what would be the priorities. So then also helping the Commission really to drive uh, on the priorities to move things forward. I think this was um, this is in general our call to have more specific funding, but not just funding, but the right funding for the right focus. And I think when I hear all the panelists, um, I hear a lot of uh, agreement that there needs to be a better collaboration, better understanding of the whole chain from the breeders to the farmers to the to the producers of the food. So if together we could develop also with Europe. Uh, this strategy, then I think we can work much more focused and also use the means which are there um, much more efficient. And then, of course, if there's focus, if there's an economic uh, proposition, then uh, to the point of Caesar, I think then also the private investors will be uh, very well, well willing to help to move uh, this forward. So this is this is our call now for uh, Horizon Europe. I also understood that there are other platforms, so we're, we will also dive into other possibilities within Europe for funding. And uh, we are very happy to continue this discussion with um, with all the experts and to try to come to, to a strategy, because personally, I think for Europe, it's also an opportunity to become a hub, a real hub on, uh, on plant protein. There is it's the future. It's also expressed in the ambition from form to fork for the Green Deal. The eco schemes are going in that direction. But I think to the point made also by, by one of the panelists, we need speed, we need acceleration. So I think um, I would also like to thank all the, um, the panelists for the, for the open discussion and uh, yeah, invite everyone to keep the discussion going. And hopefully we will find uh, a follow-up event to, uh, to define further together uh, where our focus uh, should be. So here are, and, and in the meantime, I dropped our joint letter in the chat ah, for information. Oh, that Great. Great. Yeah. So uh, maybe to all of you here, I think um, what we, what you could see if you reflect, this is work in progress, uh, but it's also collaborative work in progress, uh, but very clear kind of points to interact, to engage, to share, to take it to the next level. And yeah, there is now a path uh, within the AAPF with different stakeholders to do that. And one of the next steps is that there will be some more discussions between food and agri on the breeding side about what do you need. It's very clear that uh, the agri side and also the breeders need a vision about from the food industry. So how much is that volume going to be in 2030? Because if I invest, it takes time and that data are needed uh, there. We're going to work on that together. But uh, you could see here that um, in June, there is a summit in Wageningen, one of the maybe food hubs, uh, but there's also a lot of work being done in plant based in June 21st to 23rd. And um, we welcome everybody to be part of that next discussion and hopefully to enjoy some uh, good plant based foods as well at the same time while having uh, maybe some other liquid uh, enjoyments uh, together and uh, and just have fun and, and, and connect because that's very important. I think that is also maybe the, the uh, maybe take home for all of you. If you zoom out what everybody is saying, um, collaboration is great. Then the question is, do you know each other? And the question is no. So uh, take this home. And if you see bridges between uh, the different fields where you think you in your own individual field can make a little connection, that connection can already have a lot of impact. 
and uh, that takes time and uh, we're all working very hard we're all relatively small organizations so together i think we could uh, build this into uh, a really uh, very much collaborative uh, effort where we can all enjoy from so if you think i'm small uh, i'm in seaweed and I, I want to have something i'll come to june to the discussions and bring the whole seaweed industry with you because it's also an important industry for other reasons uh, and it's plant-based having said that i would like to um, kind of close is there a closing comment from you a take home siska No, I, I really want to thank everyone. I think I, I learned also a lot also for the uh, for the value for the farmers uh, to, to choose the right crops. I think that uh, mm -hmm. I'm a very optimistic person and I hear a lot of opportunities yeah. and uh, possibilities to uh, to collaborate further. So and as, as I uh, put in the chat, I'm happy to continue mm -hmm. this discussion. So uh, yeah. and I, I hear a lot of alignment. So um, I think this is um, the way forward to really jointly develop the strategy and then to work towards it. I think, as you said, Hera, it takes time. It's a stepwise approach, but we need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have started already today and before. So having said that, I think uh, I would like to ask you also from our position and thank Charlotte, who has done a great job in pulling it all together. Uh, applause for Charlotte, please. She's been working very hard to get it to go and it wasn't easy. Yeah, come forward, Charlotte. And also Bob, my colleague, uh, who has helped in the communication because we were a great group here um, in uh, in numbers as well. 150 people for yeah, this topic is, I think, uh, really showing an interest from everybody around maybe the world. Have a wonderful evening, uh, have a wonderful dinner and hope to see you uh, again and connect with you. Thank you very much.